every year on Lindau Island in Germany, dozens of Nobel laureates come to meet with hundreds of young scientists. It's rare for so many laureates to gather like this, so I'm taking the opportunity to ask some big questions about the state of medicine today. To try to get a picture of health. We're all getting older, but which of us is going to live for how long? With all these Nobel laureates around, I'm really keen to find out what the secret is to a long and healthy life. You can't afford to preserve every life. We don't have enough money. The problem is that the money is up here. Do you think it is possible for us to continue extending our lifespans? I am uh, maybe naively optimistic about this, uh, but I believe that the way that technology is advancing, I think it's quite a, a possibility, maybe not in our lifetimes, but um, certainly for our grandchildren, perhaps, as early as that. Do you agree? Um, I mean, it depends what you mean by extending lifespan, I guess. I feel like we are expanding our lifespan, but maybe not in an extreme way. Right? I feel like people are staying healthier a bit longer, more people will live a bit later, but even people without diseases end up dying in their early hundreds, let's say. And so there seems to be something in the organism that, like a concert of uh, effects of things that start breaking down and changing uh, that means that we can't really live much more beyond that at least not as we understand aging today though of course we don't understand that much about it so, so maybe who knows and should we be trying to live longer do you think that that's a, a worthy aim well it depends I don't think the focus should be on that alone I think we should consider a balance between adding years to life and adding life to years. I mean, that balance is very, very personal. It's worthy goal only if we can make sure that people live healthy for a long time, that they can keep working, they can keep being active. We don't need several billion more sick people. I'm sure that society could benefit from having more healthy people uh, in their later years that have had the experience of life, that have a lot to contribute to society. but. Not at any cost, I think. But the prospect of living beyond 100 is exciting and should, as many people as possible should be doing it. Uh, I believe so. I think that can only really benefit science and medicine. And the group that's increasing a lot now is the 85 plus. And that's something we should invest a lot in. So they think that we should try to make it possible to live for longer, but only if it's also a healthier life. But how old is today's world population anyway? There was a presentation at this year's meeting that caused a bit of a stir. So the laureates, to them you will put questions, but I will put questions to you about global health. Here's the first one. You can use this device to answer A, B and C. What is the life expectancy of the world population today? Is it 50, 60 or 70 years? Please answer A, B or C. About life expectancy, you answered, let me see. Ah, uh ah. -uh. You are like Swedes. This is the right answer. You see why you think that population will age because life will be longer? Because you don't know how long they already are. The best way to know something about the future is to start knowing about the present. So I got that totally wrong. I met up with Hans Rosling to get some more insight into the demographics of our ageing world. It was surprising to me in the lecture that the world population, the average life expectancy is 70 and is not growing in the way that we had understood. It has grown already. The world has been immensely successful in removing early death, especially among children. So today, Bangladesh have a life expectancy of 70. Eh? and they constitute the average of the world. This is not known, and it's sad that it's not communicated. We're understanding that life expectancy will continue. That's the way that medical science presents the data, is that it has grown and it will continue to increase. We think life expectancy will increase by 10 years during this century, but that's not so much. If you die when you are 70 or 80, it's not so much big difference. The big difference is that the child mortality is down now 
we lose 6 million children out of the 135 million born. What is changing now is that the aging of the world population is driven by something else than longer life. But even scientists haven't understood this because they are limited into their area of research, be it cancer, be it immunology, you know, be, be it blood diseases. No. So I used to explain it like this. Look here, I took these cups from the breakfast table here. This is the world population. There are two billions, one, two, two billions below 50. There is two billions, 15 to 30. One billion, 30 to 45, one, 45 to 60. And this is my cup. 60 years and older. Huh? This is me. I'm in here. So this is the world population today. 7 billion people. Why are these three missing? Is it because they died? No, they were never born. Because back then, when I was born, there were much less women giving birth. Now what will happen in the future? The big change that will age the world population is this. The old ones, like me, we will die sooner or later probably sooner, we will die. The rest, and you also, you can't believe it today, but you will grow older, 15 years older, and there will be children. The old die, the rest grow older, and have children. The old die, and the rest grow older, and have children. Did you see? The life didn't get any longer. The children didn't get any more. The number of children stopped growing. But we got three billion more in the world. Because the children, the extra children that existed have just aged. They have lived their life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they have filled up the population pyramid. Now you can see there's a much higher proportion of all people. The average age gets longer. But there's a good news for people like me. There will be longer life also. But the longer life will not add more than possibly one billion people. However, and it will add it among the elite, the most privileged in the richest countries. That's why they are sort of obsessed by living longer and longer. But the big thing in the world, why the world will have more diabetes, more cardiovascular, more cancer, is this fill-up effect, and that it will be a heavy burden, is that it will start shrinking at the bottom. At 89, Nobel laureate Oliver Smithies is, I suppose, part of this older elite. I wondered what his take was on this ageing world. What do you think the challenges are of having a globally ageing population? That's a difficult one. Can we afford to treat uh, some conditions that are extremely expensive to treat that don't have enough benefits? You have to f bite the bullet. And that, the bullet is some treatments are too expensive for the, uh, the reward. And so we can't afford, as a community, to pay for them. And, and similarly, I suppose, Hans Rosling was making the point that, that not only some treatments, but for some people, they shouldn't, those treatments shouldn't be offered, and for other people, they should be prioritised. Yes, I I'm afraid it, it, it means taking judgments of that sort, because if you have two people, one of my age, that would re require a kidney transplant, let's say, and a person who is uh, 50, the 50-year-old has a better claim than the 89-year-old. Because I'm not likely to have a life expectancy altered very much. <laughs> Maybe it might give me a year more. With a 50-year-old, it might give 40 years more. It's very dangerous uh, territory, though, it, isn't it? it well, start... it's not dangerous. It has to be faced. I mean, we have to be realistic about it. And that's the trouble. We aren't realistic about it. We're sentimental and we say everybody has a right to life and so on, which is true. But you can't afford to preserve every life. We don't have enough money. I mean, how would you feel if the focus of medical science shifts and we're not focusing any longer on this cup? How does, what does that mean to you? Three things have happened in my life. When I was 30 years old, I got cancer with metastases, a testicular cancer. I got the best treatment of the time, and here I'm sitting, 66 years old. That was terrible. I had two newly born children, you know, and I was going to die in the middle of life. Losing your parents at age four, that's horrible for a child. Then my wife and I lost a child from congenital malformation the first day. That was deeply tragic. It took 10 to 20 years before we could talk about it, you know. 
And then my dear father got Alzheimer already at age 67. You know, so the kids really never had a grandfather. He was sort of lost and then he died. Out of those three things, the first was, and the worst, was cancer at age 30. The second worst was losing a newborn. The third worst was losing a grandfather. But they're tremendously different. The order that you put those events in, do you think that connects to the order that you prioritize? You prioritize middle, middle of life, then childhood, and then older. Which family wouldn't agree with me? Biomedical science should not be guided up to the old up here when we still have so much problem down here. Take care of the middle, eh? go for the children, and if the resources are there, then take the old. One of the contentious points that's been put to me is there are people who are reaching beyond 70 to their 80s mm -hmm. and their 90s, mm -hmm. that they are not the priority of focus, that it's if we're choosing between an, an, somebody in their 80s and somebody in their 50s having a kidney transplant, that for sure it should be the person in their 50s now. I actually think that's very fallacious thinking because yeah, yeah. if you make the person at 50 survive, then you owe this person yeah, yeah. to also take care of them later. If you yeah. just have everybody survive to 65 and then you're like, you're on your own guys, you can die now. Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of society is that? It's I like mean, I think that violates basically any ethical standard yeah. that as scientists or physicians or whatever we would have. You can't just say we have to choose between the 50 year olds and the 85 year olds. It's not like that. And this part is the part that medical science is tackling. What the students here at this meeting are really tackling. Yes, the problem is that the money is up here, you know, and the researchers, when they want to be applied, have to go for where the money is. And that's why longer life in the richest country among the elite is an attractive subject to argue for. So it's fascinating to me that the older scientists we've spoken to are concerned with helping the younger people to live longer and the younger scientists I'm talking to are really interested in ageing and helping an ageing population. Ageing affects us all. We'll all lose loved ones and possibly become infirm ourselves. Clearly biomedical science can make a huge difference but ageing isn't a disease like cancer, it's inevitable. And maybe how we deal with this reality is as much a personal, social and political question as it is a scientific one. We're here in Lindau with 37 Nobel Prize winning scientists, 600 young researchers, 12 of them sponsored by Mars, and people want to hear all about the science that Mars has been doing. You know, well, the great thing about coming to Lindau is that we get to spend time with science's rock stars. You're aware that you're in the presence of greatness. And the more that we can find ways of engaging some of the finest minds in the world to helping us solve some of these grand challenges, I mean, there's got to be some great stuff in there. One of the things we do is we like to have a lunch where we basically spend time with the young scientists that we've sponsored to come here and tell them a little bit about the kind of company that we are, the kind of work that we do and why we passionately believe that these great scientists should consider coming to a company like Mars for a lifetime career in fun science that will make the world a better place. The best part really is that you get to actually meet these young scientists who will look at you in the eye and say, this is the best week of my life. To sit with a Nobel laureate and have a conversation, that is a gift. So we have a science breakfast, which is the opportunity for us to host a discussion around a very meaningful area of research of healthy ageing. So we have Liz Blackburn, who won a Nobel Prize in this field, and we put her together with a group of young scientists in a forum facilitated by ourselves. Let's think about the huge amount of years that human lives are, right? So I made a little scale bar for you on this high-tech thing here. This is a time scale. What's the li maximum lifespan of a, a worm that goes from here to here, right? Of a fruit fly from here to here. Now things get a bit better. Okay, let's go all the way out to a mouse. All right, <laughs> keep going, keep going. Okay, we've got up to kindergarten, we've got decades and decades of life. 
So the science breakfasts are always great fun, highly interactive, and a really good way to have meaningful debate in an area of public interest, but also interest to ourselves. We're in middle age here, so maybe <laughs> somebody's getting some diabetes now. I mean, that's the thing. It's not just your lifespan. There's perhaps years of living with chronic disease. I think you get the point, yeah. right? I'm just constantly struck by how we have to be thinking in terms of enormous timescales that these things are. The world is going to be facing an aging population. We're all going to get older, and there's going to be a lot more of us who are old. How do we deal with that? Helping young scientists realize that they can work with somebody and realize that these are problems that the world has to solve. And business and science can do it together. I think the private sector can play a real role because the sort of research that can be done by a company that isn't necessarily related to just the uh, quarterly bottom line is the kind of research that's complementary to what governments can fund. And I think Mars is a good example of that. So we got 37 Nobel laureates here and just over 600 young scientists and if we can play our role in catalyzing some of the magic happening between those two groups of people then we go away very happy. Thank you.